Good morning. So today I'm going to present uh, what we do at Calray uh, in the area of uh, co-designing uh, many co-architecture for uh, accelerator, for acceleration of uh, edge computing. So there will be uh, some uh, Calray technology, but I intend this to be interesting for uh, IP community involved in architecture and compilers. So just Calray exists uh, since uh, two, uh, 2009. We are above 100 people today, and we have uh, more than, uh, let's say, 60 technical people uh, working there. And we, have, uh, we had an IP, uh, IPO at Euronex uh, a few years ago. So I will uh, discuss uh, those uh, topics. So first about uh, many core acceleration, then what we uh, understand by edge computing, and then more details on the uh, processor, what we do on the software side and uh, what uh, we are going and what are the challenges ahead of us uh, in technical terms. So I start with a, a classification. <laughs> so what we have between a, a, a multi-core and a many-core. So here you see, if, if I have the laser, sorry. Okay. Here you see a traditional uh, multi-core architecture and can be characterized where you have a number of cores uh, which are symmetrical and they work uh, inside the same memory hierarchy. So they share uh, beyond the first level cache, they will share uh, the second level cache, the last level cache, uh, the IO devices. And this is a mainstream uh, compute architecture for general purpose computing we have today. And uh, the key feature of this uh, architecture is that it has to support a, a thread uh, base programming model when you want to expose a concurrency and it rely on a, a, a cache current memory system. So this is a very uh, successful and wide, very widely used uh, computer architecture. Now if you uh, have the problem to expand the compute capability by, by scaling up the number of cores, uh, you, you, you come with uh, some uh, roadblocks in that area. And uh, first, uh, and above all, you have this uh, need to maintain a global memory currency and tight uh, coupling and interaction between uh, cores. So, so at, uh, after some uh, number of cores between 16 up to 64, start to be a, a problem with energy efficiency. And uh, from the beginning, it's always a problem with the time predictability of the platform. If you have tasks, and those ta tasks they can execute, even if they are functionally independent, they will have interference with respect to time uh, uh, behavior. Now the next uh, level of uh, innovation in computer architecture, it came with a GPGPU, mainly from a GPU, the Fermi architecture, and, uh, and uh, it can be characterized as a move to uh, what is called a many core, as they define the many core uh, processing area with many core accelerators. So uh, what it does, uh, at, at, the, at the architecture level is to introduce uh, streaming multiprocessor, which are kind of compute unit with a number of stream cores and local resources like lo local storage, local cache currents, and, uh, and uh, uh, other mechanism. And those streaming multiprocessor, which are multiprocessor because they have uh, 16 or 32 uh, cores, in that particular case, uh, tightly uh, uh, synchronized cores, uh, then the machine can scale to a very high number of uh, cores by replicating the streaming multiprocessor. So it's, um, it's an aggregation of multiprocessor of a particular kind. So this is a very successful, very efficient. Uh, you can uh, handle a massively parallel tasks because you have hardware multithreading uh, of the processing at the streaming multiprocessor level. And, and you have a problem in particular uh, with uh, uh, time predictability mainly due to, uh, to different uh, issues. Uh, when you schedule work on that machine, you schedule by warp, that is a wave front of uh, execution of 32 thread at a time, for instance. And, and when you start to have different uh, data dependent processing in a warp, then you have to uh, shut down or, or, or tunnelify execution of a different uh, branch uh, of a test. 
when you start uh, emitting memory um, uh, requests which are uh, not uh, uh, sp specially related, then a so-called memory co coalescer <coughs> cannot put them together in single level two transaction and then you lose performance. So you have uh, an issue with uh, uh, data dependent and control flow dependent uh, time uh, and performance uh, va variability. And also because you have a lot of, uh, of uh, advanced but opaque hardware uh, to uh, schedule work, uh, the, the uh, the thread blocks, that is the, the uh, uh, structuring of work you do, can be dynamically uh, allocated to the streaming multiprocessor, which are different, uh, uh, there are di a number of them, up to 100 of them on a GPGPU. So you have this first uh, source of, of uh, time predictability uh, problem. And the second one is that you have a dynamic scheduling of the warp. They go as come as served by, by the dynamic uh, hardware scheduler. Now, uh, this is uh, the successful uh, model of a GPGPU. It's a mini core accelerator. But then there is a third uh, a way to approach uh, massively parallel computing, and that's the way uh, done in particular by this computer, the Sunway 26010. It was number one at uh, uh, top 500 in 2016-2017 uh, with a 41,000 uh, processor of 260 cores and up to 10 million cores. And what is interesting with this architecture is that it's based on a, a compute unit that they call a cluster, and the cluster are connected inside the, the processor by a network on chip. But what we have in a compute cluster is a master core, a memory uh, move engine, and an array of, uh, of uh, 64 uh, regular uh, uh, cores which have a local uh, store. And, and so uh, this machine is based on the clusters that, that are replicated first locally inside the chip and then globally uh, to do the, uh, to, to assemble the supercomputer. So it's a different and, and more evolved, uh, in my, in my uh, view, way of doing uh, many core accelerator where you base the compute unit, that is a unit of replication, on a fully programmable uh, core. So you can have C, C++, and other programming language, and even operating system. So inside the compute unit, you have your core, you have a data movement engines like TMA, you have local memory, and, and, and most often you have a local cache currency that doesn't extend beyond the compute unit, just like a, a streaming multiprocessor cache currency doesn't extend beyond streaming multiprocessors. Now, an, a key innovation of, a, of a many core processing done by, by NVIDIA in 2017 was introduction of a tensor core for deep learning. I quickly recall what it is because we'll see the uh, uh, interpretation of that idea on the Ikara architecture. So a tensor core processor is here to accelerate in particular convolutional uh, neural networks and does this by, by providing a matrix multiply accumulate in mixed precision uh, in, in a dedicated core that they call uh, tensor core. There are eight uh, tensor core uh, per uh, streaming multiprocessor on uh, NVIDIA machine, like the, the, Vo the Volta. So the key here is that you compute matrix multiply accumulate in a mixed precision. Now, faced with that uh, background, I, I re re I'm rewriting history, but uh, let's say it's like, uh, like this, we can uh, understand how, how we came to uh, with the many core architecture, which is CPU based, in particular in the Calray machine. Uh, you have a number of uh, design choices, and this is the co-design part uh, of, of the uh, uh, architecting of the machine. You have to decide if you are going to assemble a, a many core, what you do for the processing engine, what you do for the local memory system and the compute unit itself, and what you do for the global memory. And there are a number of uh, design choices and which has uh, 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 pros and cons. So uh, what I put in, in bold are the particular, sorry, the particular choice of the Calray machine. We go multi-core inside a, a compute unit. We have six, uh, 16 cores. Uh, we want the programming model at the compute unit to be a multi-core like classic multi-core programming model. And uh, we will have to deal with the multi-core memory traffic locally with the multi-bank parallel memory. Then for the local memory, you have a, a question whether it's a scratch pad memory explicitly addresses or implicitly address uh, like a cache, but uh, you, we need both. Uh, we need a remote DMA engine to take advantage of scratch pad memory, but those uh, remote, uh, those scratch pad memory only appear as uh, resources into particular programming model, in particular the OpenCL and OpenVX. So this is the first uh, indication of what you can do 
uh, efficiently and in a more or less standard way with those machines. For the global memory, it's a big question and a big issue. We are still dealing with it. Uh, can we make the, the machine uh, fully cache coherent on different level, or can we settle with a more restricted cache coherency? Uh, today, we do uh, uh, semi current with those cores. And we do, um, that is when we update the system memory, it's coherent for the host core. We are an accelerator, but uh, if the host core change our memory, we don't see it uh, uh, automatically. And this uh, gives the, the high level view of uh, our machine today, which is a third generation. So we have uh, five compute units, we call them cluster. Inside the compute unit, we have a 16 application core and a one management cores. And then we have local resources like DM engine, debug unit. Uh, and different uh, accelerators. And uh, the interesting part, and the, uh, where I will explain more the code design issue, is uh, at the processing element part. What we call processing element is uh, uh, the core itself. It's a tightly coupled core processor, and it's a local uh, memory system uh, level one uh, cache. And uh, besides this uh, uh, compute part, we have a lot of uh, uh, peripheral and high-speed interface. And uh, the first thing uh, we can note with that kind of architecture is that once you have a CPU-based uh, many-core architecture, you can play with the uh, uh, spatial partitioning uh, provided by the uh, compute unit structuring of a many-core. If you decide to put a kind of buyers on the global interconnect, uh, there are different kind of uh, global interconnect, but let's say on all of them, then you can start to have uh, isolation and, and hosting of different functions and different uh, operating environments. In particular, this is an abstraction of two application cases uh, we have, uh, mostly for, let's like, say, uh, a long-range drone and, and other application. And so you need to have uh, uh, the control command, uh, hard real-time, model-based uh, uh, programming, like a sketch suite. Then you need a secure communication part with a security uh, kernel running a communication <coughs> stack. You need machine learning, and you need uh, other uh, embedded HPC functions all that with different uh, operating environments. Now we go to discuss more edge computing and why it, uh, it can be a good fit for this kind of CPU-based mini-core ac uh, accelerators. So first, uh, what uh, we do understand with uh, edge computing, uh, I've taken two definitions, the one by Intel and the one by NVIDIA. So uh, I will not read the text, but I only highlight what is always in common. You compute close as close as possible to a source of data. You have an intelligent edge device that is onboard analytics and AI. It's very useful for vision-based, for robotics, and of course to support a driver and in our case, uh, pilot of different uh, area vehicles. Now for the NVIDIA part, it's all again processing data as, as close as possible to the source artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence near the generation, the source of data, and, and even more, if you are offline, you, you, you need to be able to process a large amount of data. So this uh, came to the uh, idea uh, or the definition of what, uh, what is an intelligent system. And uh, at Carre, we try to, to uh, elaborate on that. So our, our understanding and definition of intelligent system is uh, is a combination of a traditional cyber physical system where you have a processing of the external environment uh, input data and actuators. So you have to deal with the real uh, outside physical time. You have to deal with safety and security. But now we see that with the edge computing, you, we have to include uh, uh, artificial intelligence under various forms. The most uh, uh, the, the, the most used is, uh, is uh, the deep learning techniques, but it's not the only machine learning uh, uh, kind, kind of function we have. And the computer is becoming intense, not only for artificial intelligence, but for image signal, numerical, crypto and gala fields, and, and even graph processing. And these apply to networking and storage intelligent accelerator. This is how they are called, autonomous driving systems. And now 5G, telecom infrastructure, industrial robotics, aerospace and defense. This is the historical market of CARE and other edge computing applications. So this is the only uh, product-like uh, discussion I will have. Our, our main uh, product offer today has started with networking and storage acceleration. I will not go into details, but this is uh, an offer. And uh, I have a backup slide if you want more. 
But the interesting point with, in relation with uh, many core uh, architecture, CPU-based, is that on this machine, we have five clusters. On one cluster, we will run uh, Linux plus uh, the networking and, uh, uh, and storage stack. And then we will deploy on the other uh, four cluster uh, on top of a lightweight POSIX OS uh, the rest of the uh, uh, stacks that, that were interesting in this particular storage market, which is the SPDK. This is just to give uh, an idea on how, how a CPU-based many core architecture can, be, uh, can leverage the partition between the compute unit and then distribute and distinguish between the control plane and the data, data plane processing. Now I go to the next step, um, automated cars. So CalRay since 2019, I started working with NXP. Uh, uh, on uh, 2020 at CES, uh, we demonstrated that our, our third generation processor was running a YOLO V3 uh, uh, faster than uh, NVIDIA Xavier GPGPU. And uh, we were at uh, 20 uh, frames per second. They, are, they were on the blog at uh, 17 frames per second. Now maybe it has uh, improved since, of course. But uh, what we have now with NXP is uh, they associate uh, in the uh, autonomous uh, driving uh, uh, demonstration platform. We do the acceleration uh, for the perception and, and for the uh, localization. Uh, sorry, for the past planning. So here I recall uh, the SAE uh, uh, Society of Automotive uh, Engineers uh, classification of uh, automate automation in cars. We have level one, uh, very simple, level two. Uh, these are mostly ADAS. And then we, there is the, the, the road to autonomous uh, driving where it's fully autonomous here. But the interesting part here are the compute requirements. So what we call TOPS, uh, what you need for deep learning inference, it's mostly int 8 uh, to int 32 deep learning inference. So now the range is 50 TOPS and it has to move way beyond 100 tops. And we see also teraflops. No, here it's not teraflop of deep learning, it's teraflop of FP32, and that's very heavy, in particular in the past planning part. So Caraway, we are working in this particular area here with the Blue Box 3 line of products by NXP. So for the software part of this automated driving, we rely on the AutoWear Auto uh, uh, project, which is a very uh, big open source project, mostly uh, uh, funded and contributed to by Japanese company, in particular uh, Tire 4, uh, which has uh, defined the, the code base and which was contributing to it. So we recognize a classic part of uh, automated uh, driving uh, stack. So you have uh, the sensing part with the different uh, sensor, uh, camera, lidar, inertial manage, uh, uh, movement unit, uh, global positioning uh, by satellite. And you have a first stage where you need deceleration, which is uh, called uh, perception. So in perception, you first have to, to understand where you are located in relation to the environment, and then to detect what, what outside of your car. And then you have to do some uh, prediction of what will happen next. Now, after you have uh, this uh, perception done, and this mostly uh, technology from robotics here. Then you have to do the planning, so you know what is the intent, the mission for the vehicle, and you have to, to, to start computing how you will move the vehicle. And then at the end, you uh, go to actuation. Uh, you have different uh, level of functional safety here, but as long as here you have a high, high level of functional safety, then you can deal with a, a more high performance and, and then less uh, less uh, uh, functionally safe uh, because you, you rely on redundancy for execution, both spatially and temporally. So this is uh, the AutoWay Auto. So I, I talk about this because this is a stack report for the uh, Blue Box uh, platform in particular. And uh, uh, what we do currently is that uh, we process uh, camera and, lig and LIDAR for perception. So we have OpenCV, OpenVX for pre-post-processing. These are uh, de facto standard. And uh, we have uh, object detection. Uh, today we use YOLO. And we also to process uh, the LIDAR. And the LIDAR, you have to do a normal distribution transform. It's, a, it's an el elaborate processing where you have to match the point cloud uh, br brought back by the LIDAR compared to the uh, point of, of the uh, map. And so this is the uh, perception part. And for the path planning part, this is the part. We, so this is uh, where we, you need a lot of tops in deep learning here, a lot of uh, uh, pixel processing here. And here uh, you, 
you start computing how you will uh, uh, plan the, the movement of the car. It's mainly C++ programming, FP32 intensive, local parallelization with OpenMP at the, at the multi-core level, and uh, uh, a lot of Kalman filtering, and it requires a very good uh, implementation of the Eigen uh, library. And for the rest of the software, we don't do ourselves. We rely on ESOL, a, a big uh, company uh, in Japan, and, and they, they, ha they, they have 70% uh, of the market of uh, aerospace and automotive uh, uh, operating environments. And uh, all that is based on the auto rest stack, the robot operating system, which is the open source uh, code base where all the uh, advanced robotics is developed, and the DDS, uh, object management group uh, data distribution standard, where you coordinate the processing nodes in a standard and, uh, and time uh, predictable way. Now, I move to the last uh, things uh, that we are deeply involved uh, with regard to edge computing at Carway. Uh, now we see that uh, uh, there is a move for in 5G to disaggregate the processing. So here you have the classic uh, LT, uh, long-term evolution, 4G. So all that is defined by, by a consortium called uh, 3GPP, and 3GPP defines uh, different piece of technology, and, and then there is a group called Open Run that uh, uh, has, uh, is, has tasked itself with uh, disaggregating the way you uh, process uh, the uh, telecommunication from the radio, uh, remote radio head and the baseband unit before it was going directly to the uh, uh, core network of the uh, telco operator. Now it's being disaggregated. All this uh, work of disaggregating the uh, infrastructure for 5G communication is done by a group called uh, ORAN. And it's in these three groups that uh, define the uh, paper interface uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, present a use case. And so we see that it's interesting because once you disaggregate uh, the telecom infrastructure from the, from the antenna radio unit, uh, you can have multiple opportunities for accelerating the processing. You have a lot of processing here uh, for, the, uh, um, for the beamforming, for the FFT. And then we go into the distributed unit where you start, uh, you, you finish processing of the uh, layer uh, one of the uh, OZ communication uh, uh, stack. Then you go into a central unit where you host more functions which are less time critical, but you can also put added value processing, in particular uh, multi access edge computing, which is where you will put, for instance, uh, analytics or artificial intelligence close to the data. And this is a, a, a work defined by the HC, how, how to put, uh, uh, make uh, uh, processing here. And this goes then to the classical operator network. But you see all the uh, opportunities for acceleration and which are slightly different uh, with regard to uh, uh, operating environment and the tasks you perform, but it's mostly acceleration. And the big name of acceleration, of course, they go in that area too. Now I go into a little bit more details. Uh, the open run uh, uh, define what they call split. So you have the radio unit. You have, in fact, the, la the OZ layer. So you have, uh, uh, here you have uh, the, the physical function. You have the data link function. You have the transport and network function here. And, uh, and the uh, uh, all run define how you can split the processing chain. So here you have a downstream and upstream. And uh, they give numbers to those splits. So here, for instance, it's split two. Here, it's split, uh, if I remember, it's split six, it's split seven, and here it's split seven dot two, it's a detail. And all those acronyms, you can see them here. What is interesting is that the, the uh, low phi goes to the radio unit, but the distributed unit where Calray is in, interesting in, in developing acceleration, it's, um, it's a high physical and, and the low part of the medium access control. So from this, uh, uh, 3GPP uh, reference uh, uh, design, they explain that if you do a distributed unit, you can do it two ways. Uh, you have a, a CPU and you will uh, call an accelerator function by function, and this is what Intel does with the FlexRun uh, reference platform and they accelerate with the Al with a, uh, Altera FPGA. Or you can do inline processing, and inline processing, you connect directly your accelerator to the radio unit uh, through what is called the front hole network. You do a lot of uh, high-fi 
function, then you go to the uh, uh, host CPU of the distributed unit, and then you go to the central unit using the, that interface. And so uh, Carrera is working on that. Now you can ask uh, what is the value of having a many core accelerator in that area. The value is as follows. Um, a lot of the hi-fi processing is uh, time critical. And in order to do that on the general purpose machine, a multi-core machine, you have to do a, a very large scale over provisioning because you have to meet deadlines. You have a hundred uh, microsecond deadline for receiving frame and you have a millisecond like uh, deadline for processing data in the, in the time critical part. So because of that, if you have a general purpose processor, a multi-core with, inter with a interference on all the, the part of the memory hierarchy, you have to do massive over-provisioning in order to, to, uh, to meet the deadline. When you start to leverage local memories, local processing resource in compute cluster, in a compute unit, then it's much easier. But of course, uh, you, you also have to uh, assemble the, the multi-core part, which is difficult to program with a domain-specific language to help you automate the distribution and the mapping of the, of the function. But this is uh, what we do today, and, and, and we work with the code base of, of OpenAir Interface, which is a project uh, uh, in France, but it's well known in the world, and we also work with uh, uh, EMS Bordeaux, which provides us a specific code generation for the LDPC uh, decoders. Now, that I've described what is the part of edge computing. We can deal with uh, many core accelerators, especially the CPU base, but also the GPGPU base. They are interesting and they go in those areas as well. I will spend a little bit of time on the uh, uh, processor and IP. So just to uh, recap, we have a, a, a many core base, uh, uh, a CPU based many core architecture. So you have a compute unit, uh, that we call uh, uh, compute cluster. This is a cluster again, 16 core on this machine, uh, plus management core, plus uh, local peripherals. And then I will spend a little bit of time on, on to the, uh, the core and processing element itself. So this uh, core is a very, very main solution world. And, uh, and VLIW was uh, defined by Joss Fisher and by Bob Rowe. And, and each of them, they, they, they follow a different uh, architecture view, and, and they, it implies different compiler techniques. And so uh, let's say with a classic uh, VLIW architecture, uh, you do simple uh, select operation and, and multi-way conditional branch to uh, deal with the uh, more amount of branching you have with multiple issue. Uh, you don't want to see a trap when you uh, advance load, so you have a dismal, uh, dismissible loads. And uh, the key compiler techniques, uh, it's well known, I guess, in this uh, audience, is a trust scheduling and, and, pre and predication if conversion technique based on the Friedenberger algorithm. Now we see uh, qu quite similar ones in different compilers, uh, and I was surprised to see good one in the GCC compiler. Now it has been applied to Multiflow, uh, Trace Processor, HP Labs, LX architecture. I know this one very well because it was licensed to ST Micro, and we developed compilers and we developed this core for, for a number of years. And uh, the EPIC architecture is a di different way of doing VLIW. Uh, first, the uh, instruction is set is fully predicated, so you have an additional operand, which is a Boolean execution predicate for each instruction. You have a fully speculative uh, load, so when you trap your load, you can uh, uh, remember you have trap, and then you check and you, you execute the trap uh, once you are, you are sure the speculation has reduced to execution. You have advanced load to uh, work around the fake, uh, 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 conservative memory dependency and you have rotating register. And this has a uh, motivated modulo scheduling and very advanced predication algorithms. The R key is the best one, but to, to our experience with the various scores, the uh, JSFANG from Intel is the best one. And there are the examples. Now, uh, with regard to the Carre one, uh, why, why did we uh, follow? In fact, we follow the uh, idea that uh, the IS64 was very uh, difficult to compile for, in particular, the instruction scheduling part. And um, so, in fact, nowadays it's, it's possible to design a VLIW uh, core and throughout it a standard compilation technique for superscalar machine, and it will work very well. So you have to uh, take care of a few details, but it's feasible. So no more uh, complex templates, uh, no more uh, bundling, no more uh, exotic uh, predication. So you can do it 
And, and the OR experience shows that uh, you get good, good results from LLVM and GCC. Of course, you miss a few extra smart. But then after making this compiler friendly for classic compilers, uh, there is a great idea developed uh, by the power line of, a, of a, a processor, which is the vector scalar ISA. If you look at how you improve the uh, data processing of a core, if we move from a single, uh, uh, single uh, simple CPU, we'll add coprocessors for floating point, and then we'll, we'll expand the coprocessor to, for uh, SCMD processing. Now, the, uh, uh, what uh, IBM understood after uh, inventing first the risk but uh, also inventing advanced uh, CMD processing with Altivec first, then the cell B, and then what they did in the power is that it's very uh, interesting to merge the scalar and the vector that is the CMD inside the register part into the same IZ. And uh, you do that by, by operating uh, uh, large uh, data items. Uh, you represent them as a register tuples. So if you have a 64-bit register, in a, in a pair of register, you have 128 bit, and a quadruple of register, you have 256 uh, bits. So this is the vector scalar ASA. Again, it's, uh, uh, we follow that path, but it has been discovered and, and argued why it was so uh, advanced and so different than bolt and, uh, bolted on uh, CMD units by, by IBM. Now we need DSP capabilities for what we do uh, in low-level processing. And we need CPU capabilities because we need to run a rich OSCs. In particular, we have a, a Linux in our storage solution. And we did even advanced work in instruction virtualization. In fact, we are more uh, virtualizable than the modern ARM and RISC-5 uh, uh, architectures. And the detail I can uh, discuss later. Now, this is only for the core. Now, for, for the heavy lifting of uh, uh, deep learning uh, inference, you need uh, more capabilities, a bigger data pass, and we do that by tightly coupling a tensor core processor. So we have the VLIW core and one or, or two issue lanes of the six issue VLIW architecture I use to first do load store in, inside the core processor and then uh, uh, activate uh, operation, which are most of them matrix multiply add uh, operation with mixed precision, like, just like it was defined by the tensor core of the NVIDIA architecture. But uh, if you look at into the papers that deconstruct the NVIDIA uh, uh, tensor core programming, it's very comp complicated to understand and then to program. And, and uh, one of the reasons it's uh, complicated is due to the data layout. You have data layout in memory, and you have data layout in your, in your register, and, and you have to operate the data, which is matrix data. It's not one-dimensional data. So not, not only we have the tightly coupled uh, coprocessor, but we did some uh, interesting uh, part with the uh, restructuring of the load and, and later store. And we'll just give a few details. So first, just to explain what's happening with the matrix multiply, uh, multiply add operation, let's say we are operating int 8, so it's, it's a byte with, for instance, asymmetric quantization, and we multiply, so we do a deep scalar product, and when we accumulate, so here, these are the byte number. So you see here, we have one coprocessor register, which is here 256 bits. So these are the byte number, but, but we consider those 256 bytes as a four rows of eight bytes. Now, so let's say that the activation here, like that for instance, that the, uh, that the weight of the, of the convolution in a convolutional network, we do the same interpretation of the contents of the register. We just assume it is transposed. But basically, it's transposed when being operated, but when it's, uh, uh, we load data into it, we load it this way. Always, we, we consider four rows of some variable number. And now we produce the result we have widening because we multiply int 8, we accumulate in int 32. Now we have uh, four bytes per element. And since we have a four byte four matrix, we have to uh, concatenate two registers. So 512, and these are the number of bytes. But here we still maintain the invariant that we will have across this group of registers, we can have a pair of registers, quadruples of a register that is 124 bits in one operand, but always structure into four rows 
of a vari variable number of, of elements which depends on the size of, of elements and how much uh, a, a vector register we concatenate. We call them re vector register, but the, the coprocessor register. Now, the part on how to avoid Morton indexing, you want to, to load your data from a regular memory layout. You, you have your matrices in row order or major, major uh, or row major or column major order in memory. So let's say we have this uh, row major like in C, and so here again have the byte. So I have, I have my big, ma big matrix in memory, and if I uh, read uh, 32 bytes, 256, in fact, I, I, I will not have my, my sub matrix to operate. My sub matrix to operate, it's here. So how do I, I get that into my, my uh, uh, tensor coprocessor? In fact, I do four loads. Each one is a load, and the load will target a register quadruple. But each load will scatter uh, eight bytes, in fact, a shunt of 64 bits, into four destination registers, either the first row, the second row, the third row, etc. And then at the end of this load, let's say this, this guy here has exactly the layout here. So this is how we manage to have a very simple uh, uh, memory layout and, and operand flow inside this uh, tensor uh, coprocessor. Now just uh, to, to, to elaborate and to finish on the architecture, uh, we have the uh, compute unit, so we have uh, uh, 16 cores, but uh, we have a local memory system, and the local memory system is based on a multibank. Uh, so uh, we have uh, 16 banks and a kind of a logarithmic tree interconnect and then we have other uh, bus master. Uh, we have a, a local DMA engine, just like we, we discussed for the CPU-based mini core architecture with scratchpad memories. And uh, we have a local uh, accelerator for symmetric and hashing. And uh, we have a, a security safety island where the uh, management core uh, is uh, completely isolated. This is configurable. And it's also run all the part of the secure boot when booting the compute cluster. But it's just to uh, bridge the gap between the local P architecture and the global architecture. Now, a key part and a key issue for the architecture design is that uh, what kind of memory system we can provide with this kind of machine. So for the uh, core and coprocessor, that is a processing element, it's uh, very classic. Uh, because we are very interesting in time predictable computing, we always have uh, LRU caches because they are the only one which do not have a timing predictability issues. It was a result uh, proved uh, by, by the community, by, by, by uh, Wilhelm in particular. It's a rise through, uh, et cetera. Now, what is interesting is that we have four megabytes of uh, local storage, and we can configure this four megabytes either in scratch pad memory or level two cache. When we do deep learning in front, in fact, there is very little need for caching. It's not efficient. We need to broadcast uh, the uh, uh, weight across the compute uh, unit. And so we, uh, we use a broadcast knock into the uh, uh, scratch pad memory. So, so this is configurable. For the cache currency, all the uh, bus master at the cluster level are cache current, level one cache current. Because they share all the same storage resources, it's a L2 cache current at the cluster level. But by default, we don't have the, the local uh, level two coherence. So in principle, this is not a problem for OpenCL and for the multi-node robotic operating system uh, function that we map with our application. But it can be a problem when uh, running a, a, a large-scale uh, application stack, in particular uh, uh, DPDK, SPDK, and today we are looking at mapping a VPP from uh, Intel which is a vectorized uh, packet processing uh, uh, framework. Now, we have a way to address that, but it's just to say that uh, uh, for us, uh, we follow the, uh, uh, the view or, or the philosophy of uh, many core architecture where we don't have the global cache currency between the local, uh, between the compute units. Just uh, a word on the global interconnect. In fact, on this machine, we need two global interconnect because we have a lot of work to do with the uh, Ethernet. It's a high-speed Ethernet, 200 gig Ethernet. And because of that, uh, when you uh, work with that, it's a uh, stream-based. You don't have addresses. You have stream, and you want the stream, the frame, to be dispatched across the compute units and across the cores. 
And so, uh, and then this is for the receive part, for the transmit part. Uh, you have to, to schedule to, to decide uh, what is the priority uh, class and the priority flow controls that will apply. It's a, it's a, it's a lossless Ethernet uh, kind of framework. So we have a one, uh, uh, one NOC uh, for, for this uh, stream uh, processing, and we have another NOC for the classical load store based, uh, address based uh, transactions. Uh, we have a combination of, um, of a MMU and uh, MPU, and they are the ones which provide physical isolation when you go to this uh, global fabric when we want to isolate functions. Now, uh, I talk about the, um, uh, the current uh, silicon, thanks to a uh, different uh, EU project, in particular Mont Blanc and the uh, European Processor Initiative project, we have been developing the MPPA compute unit into an IP which has a, a point of uh, interest uh, among uh, our partners. And so we've been improving a lot, uh, both the VLIW core and the tensor core processor. So this is already running on FPGA, we already the tooling is uh, operational. So uh, for uh, a lot of work on the shuffling, insert extract uh, uh, data, we didn't uh, put 8-bit uh, SIMD because before we were doing video processing in HEVC with 10-bit and 12-bit pixels. But in fact, for machine vision, we need a lot of 8-bit. So uh, we put 8-bit uh, after we saw application for, from those areas. Uh, we, uh, we add classical support for vectorization. This is, uh, again, co-designed with the compiler capabilities. The FPU has been improved a lot. In particular, there is a quadruple operator which has fuse dual multiply dual out without uh, intermediate rounding. And that's very useful for deep learning, for complex uh, arithmetic, and for different kind of uh, FP32 heavy like polynomial evaluation. We have in pro polynomial uh, trajectory generation of past planning. And we have a mini uh, matrix multiply here. The tensor compressor has even more register, it was 4864. And then we have been regularizing uh, the uh, load store. Uh, they are smart, uh, that I will not describe, but uh, at the end result, it's uh, twice the performance of int uh, 832 and eight times the uh, performance of FP1632. We need that because we want to apply Winograd transform and they work better with FP16 than uh, in, uh, quantized integers. Now I give an example of uh, what we did to improve further the uh, deep learning performance. So uh, when it comes to a deep learning in France, uh, you have the choice between I make a big data flow machine uh, or I do a very big systolic array or I have a tensor cores uh, like in a GP GPU. And us, uh, we keep the philosophy of uh, associating a tensor core with each, uh, with each core, giving processing element. But we leverage uh, very ancient ideas, which are uh, when people were thinking about distributed computing, they were using a hypercube uh, kind of connection. And they, they explain and publish how you make matrix multiply, Fourier transform, and, and a lot of work based on the uh, hypercube. Uh, a, a very simple hypercube is, is, the, um, is a ring. So we connect four adjacent uh, processing elements with uh, this bidirectional ring with 256-bit uh, bandwidth in each direction. And then what we do, it's uh, more elaborate than the classical uh, hypercube-based machine because our, our goal here, we have the weight, the uh, parameters of the neural network, which are in memory shared by all the processing elements. We have the activation the same. And uh, we want to move that into the register for processing, but we want to, to cut the redundant memory access. If you have a big uh, systolic array, you, you, uh, uh, you eliminate the intermediate result. So what we do is that we, we have a collaboration using this ring where uh, each one will uh, load a half a quarter of its uh, data set activation and, and will uh, will have uh, the required bandwidth, so. And then, uh, yes, uh, I will uh, go quickly. We have OpenCL base uh, and uh, C++ for the two kind of application we, we support. Uh, uh, OpenCL, uh, we, we, uh, 
in fact, maps the OpenCL abstract machine directly on the architecture. So in, in the OpenCL global machine, you have compute units, constant global memory, and uh, you have uh, processing element and compute unit, and also you have the idea of a sub-device. So sub-device in OpenCL is where you group a number of compute units and give them a queue of commands. So all that we uh, implement and uh, uh, we uh, apply that. So what we saw is that uh, OpenCL comes with a, a drawback, at least the 1.2, you have to come with OpenCL C compiler. So uh, we use LLVM and Clang OpenCL C, but then people uh, like to uh, reuse, in particular when we get, uh, let's say, past planning code, uh, C++. So we develop an extension where in the OpenCL C kernel, you say, oh, by the way, this function is a native function. And this is an ID that was introduced by uh, TI uh, on the Keystone uh, machine uh, called OpenMP Dispatch with OpenCL. So from OpenCL, we can decide, or oh, then we uh, send all the computation to classical POSIX-based uh, compute. And we did that by extending the uh, compiler and calling native function. This is a, a very quick uh, thing to, to say that uh, in OpenCL, it's very difficult to, to communicate between compute units. Everything has to go through the global memory. So us, we uh, took the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, SHMEM and, and, and uh, uh, supercomputer like uh, put get uh, APIs and we implement that so we can uh, work between the local memory and global memory uh, seamlessly and in a synchronous way. Uh, in order to support C++ uh, in OpenCL, we have to extend the memory model. In particular, we have to add the private uh, DDR segment. In OpenCL, you have to support uh, atomics at the local level and the global level in a different way, and all that is uh, uh, implemented by your firmware. And this OpenCL extended with native code and uh, using the sub-device of OpenCL to provide uh, areas of uh, computation with a similar application. This is what we call the CAF, the CAF framework, and they are basically the, the, the key uh, uh, processing capabilities uh, we, pro we provide. And finally, we have a, a deep learning compiler. Uh, so it's completely automated from standard uh, train network in those frameworks. And it generates uh, 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 inference code by doing all those uh, techniques, which we, we will find in other um, uh, deep learning compilers. We are, we are working on TVM, Tensor Virtual Machine, to integrate all that. But currently, our production is based on this uh, standalone tool. Uh, what is very advanced is the uh, is scheduling and mapping of computation across compute units. Uh, and then I will finish uh, by saying, uh, we do C++ compiler. Let's say we enable, for instance, uh, auto vectorization in GCC. You give this loop, and this is not software pipeline for clarity. You see that it will do the while load. It will vectorize the loop. There are 32 bit, bit uh, data. Here it's a loading 256, that is a quadruple of 60-bit register, and it will uh, process them in a two floating point uh, word quadruple. So it's a four uh, floating point add. It stores the quadruple. So, and then when you pipeline that, you have uh, your high performance loop, and you see it's a very compiler friendly. It just uh, stock uh, GCC uh, auto vectorization. Uh, you have to complement the uh, auto vectorization by efficient uh, mathematical libraries. We do that with the SLIF uh, library. Uh, very advanced uh, product. So this is the first result we have in the first release we, we did. Now we have the third release. Um, uh, and you see exponential, double floating point, uh, square root, double uh, precision, pair. And this is the kind of speed up these are cycle counts. So not only you have to work on the compiler, but you have to work on an ancillary uh, libraries and the language libraries in the vector form. And this is a quite of work. It's very interesting. For those who lack arithmetic, uh, they do quite elaborate uh, uh, use of string uh, polynomial evaluation, and they manage to have a one ULP uh, uh, precision over the whole range. Now, a last point, and the last project we uh, leverage is uh, called uh, SIMDE, SIMD Everywhere. It's a very nice project where it has a translation of every built-in of uh, uh, x86 uh, ARM uh, power into plain C, or into built-in of order architecture. So if you take this project and you have a, a, pro a program with a lot of, uh, let's say, x86 built-in, here 
Uh, we have an example of a LDPC decoder who, who, who was using heavily this particular uh, sign function. I will inject the sign of a B into each lane of A. So this is uh, the documentation from Intel. Now, to, in SCMDE, this is the plain definition SCMDE. They will uh, just uh, send to the native S uh, EPI 8 uh, on x86. Then they have an evaluation for plain architectures which will rely on automatic vectorization to do a not a too bad job. And in, in the case of Calway, we just say, then uh, go and use the Calway built-ins. And uh, that's uh, very effective. We see that the overhead of using that is uh, quite, uh, uh, quite acceptable. And we are developing this project so we can uh, gobble any kind of uh, SIMD optimized uh, uh, application code we, we see coming to us. And I will uh, conclude by uh, saying that uh, all that work uh, has been supported by a number of, uh, of course, of investors and, and customers, but also project, national project, and, and uh, a European project. Uh, a key European project was the Mont Blanc 2020, which uh, helped uh, Mont Blanc 2020, which uh, helped us uh, uh, design the uh, IP, the cluster IP, the, the, the small clusters that we will uh, provide later. So we did all the emulation and all the work stack for this on Mont Blanc 2020. And then we are part of the EPI SGA1 project where we had two acceleration tracks, the RISC-5 acceleration track, which uh, you, you saw in the news uh, two weeks ago with uh, the, the, uh, the hello world of the first uh, machine. And then the automotive and edge acceleration was delegated to Calray. And so we, we defined and we developed the IP for that. But uh, it's not sure that uh, CPERL is going to uh, implement it because they say it's uh, one million dollars per, per square millimeter or whatever. So it's a big money talk now. And uh, then, so what we did for the EPI, uh, first we had to do all the uh, mapping to uh, 16 nanometer TSMC. And then we did a reduced scale uh, cluster with only uh, four PEs. And the advantage is that uh, now we have a much shorter uh, latency here. And uh, we have the eight memory banks. So this is uh, what we have and where we develop the advanced uh, feature uh, I just mentioned in particular on the PE. Uh, I will uh, just not discuss that. We are preparing a second silicon of this MPPS3 with a number of improvements, twice the local memory, improvement in the core coprocessor, improvement in the various IOs. But uh, we, we have an RTL freeze uh, in December and tape out uh, early next year. And then for SGA2, now we start an important point is that uh, we understand that uh, RIS-5 uh, ecosystem is here to, to stay. And uh, for us, we realize it's become uh, more and more expensive to maintain and port Linux on our cores. So in particular for HPC, which is the target of the uh, uh, part two of the European Processor Initiative, uh, our, our proposition, which is still uh, being discussed uh, along with the rest of the GA2 program, is to uh, replace the management core we have with a RISC-5 uh, RISC cores. So we will keep the quad uh, core with a ring uh, communication and very high processing capabilities in deep learning. And then we uh, delegate uh, all the standard software stack, in particular for, for HPC, the communication stack of MPI and, and, um, and RDMA on the RISC V. And of course, we are working the RISC V that is available to us, uh, starting with the uh, CVA 6, that is the Ariane core from uh, ETH. And uh, I will conclude um, that the uh, evolution of accelerator is more on now on integrating completely the memory system and the cache currency between the uh, server and the accelerator. And this is a track we have to follow. And it will require a very advanced uh, stuff. And to conclude, our machine has been uh, designed into third generation and, and in, in fact, a six uh, silicon. It's iterating for edge computing. We see that using VLIW and Tensor Core coprocessor, it's a quite effective uh, uh, solution. We had uh, to do a lot of work, nevertheless, in different uh, parts. Uh, we, uh, the main challenge we see today in many core architecture are related to the uh, cash currency. In fact, there are uh, three areas of cash currency. SMP cash currency, so the, the core between different uh, uh, clusters are cash current. 
I/O currency, someone is playing with PCI or, or, or other interface, uh, changing your data, and accelerator currency, that is uh, uh, the memory system of the host is current with your, your memory system. And there is a lot of uh, issue with uh, uh, dealing with high-speed Ethernet termination, uh, load balancing and control flow, and, and also with the cache currents. And these are two different areas for global interconnects, so that's why we have two of them. And uh, we have a big thanks for those projects and a, a super big thanks for those uh, communities, for the incredible, incredible work and value and quality uh, we, we leverage from. Thank you.